prisoner at the bar, you are accused of driving a four-ton articulated lorry under the influence of drink, refusing to take a blood test, using foul and profane language, and causing grievous bodily harm to four police officers, to wit, beating them about the face and head with your bare fists. How do you plead? Guilty, my lord. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, and Joan Sims in. Nah, it's not messing about. <laughs> Welcome. Now, I must tell you, they had given me a very naughty line to start the show with, but I said, no, I'm adamant, and I whipped it out. Oh, quick as a flash. <laughs> yes. Oh, I got busy with my little blue pencil and erased it from the script, because all I want to say is that it's lovely to be back. Excuse me, excuse me, and excuse me, please, excuse you, me. you, please. Can't you see I'm pontificating? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sorry to interrupt your flow, but I just wondered, uh, have you have you noticed anything funny about Joe? Yes, but it's not the sort of thing you talk about in public. <laughs> no, 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 I mean this morning she was acting strangely. Mm? I think she's in... She's not! She's not <laughs> in love. In love? With me. With you? Mm. With you? Oh! Oh, no, you're not exactly love's young dream, dear, are you? <laughs> Standing there in your tweed acting jacket with your carnation gone all droopy. <laughs> she is, I tell you. Hello, Rabbit. boys. Oh. Hello, Kenny. Oh. Hello, Hugh. Oh, dear, oh. it's true. <laughs> Hugh, dear, I, I hope you don't mind. I've, I've brought you a little present. Oh, oh Joan, how oh. sweet. Oh. I've always wanted a brown paper bag. <laughs> oh, good. There's another present inside it as well. And there's a card. Let's see, let's see. Roses are red, violets are blue, but I think that you are the loveliest hue. Oh, <laughs> the mind boggles. Oh, look, get on and open it. Get it over with. I made it for you myself. Oh, oh, Joan, it's a pullover. You knit. Pardon? <laughs> a lovely Fair Isle pullover. Fair Isle pullovers went out in 1952. Not in Fair Isle, they didn't. That's typical of you, always knocking. That's all you ever do, knock, knock. <laughs> Who's there? Ignore him. <laughs> Joan, ignore him. He's just being facetious. He doesn't understand. Oh, Hugh. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> I can't stand any more of this, can't Douglas, come on, get me out of this with one of your unsentimental, crisp, down-to-earth announcements. War and peace. <laughs> Episode 480. <laughs> Food is so short during the siege of Moscow that Natasha is thinking of selling her... Oh, he's off. Yes. Uh, Mr. Williams is understandably bitter, having failed the audition for the part of Natasha. Oh, that's a lie! That is a lie! Don't listen to it, it's a lie! I was given a my Napoleon! In a blonde wig? It wasn't a wig. It wasn't a wig at all, it was a fur hat. Douglas, weren't you about to announce something? Oh, very well. Speaking of war and peace... Oh, shut up, give yourself a plug. It brings me to the threatened walkout of female Swiss roll operatives at the Happy Bun Bakery Bootle. Our roving correspondent, Frank Spongecastle, has been taking a look at things up there. Frank, what's your opinion of the situation, in a nutshell? I, 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 I mean, I've got the hell here. I, I, I'm telling the last glass of you. I think I, the one I can't feel anything I'm not. I'm sharing my name. I'm an absolute disgrace. I imagine you you mean all is not well in the Swiss road. Oh, well, 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 not the call. I mean, I'm all in the same table, same dog, same, 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 same,
Well, I'm talking about girls that make them. Uh, they, they, uh, they, about what? The, the position of female hands in bootle. I don't think we want to go into any... No, that's an open... I'm going to tell you how to do that rather all that confusing. To sum up, Frank, what lies ahead of these girls who have staked all on a Swiss road? Uh, yeah, I see. Well, thank you very much for that. Well, I'm better done, better done by hand. Quite, yes. Take the bakewell tart. I'd rather not. It's bad enough to pronounce the last call. And thank you, Frank I don't understand a single word I'm saying. I'm a very blithering idiot. Next week, we shall be hearing how the pill has hit the plastic gnome industry. <laughs> Speaking of plastic gnomes, it's Cracker Jack and Ori with Mother Time. And tripping across the studio in her magic galoshes, here comes Madcap Maud Nethersoul. Hello, Tinies, and Biggies, too. I wonder how many of you know where Bangkok is? <laughs> It's in a land far away where they do everything from right to left. Well, practically everything. <laughs> and that's where today's story comes from. Long ago, there was an emperor with a weakness for wine, women, and bean shoots. He lived in the palace of a thousand winds, and his other problem was <laughs> that he had no son to carry on his life. So he summoned his wives and said, Plang Fu Ping, which means, Why have I hundreds of daughters and no son? See, the end of my dynasty is in sight. <laughs> and all the wives averted their eyes in shame, except the head wife, her of the tiny feet and big everything else. <laughs> and she said, Wang Fing Tong, which means, why not consult the wise man in the marketplace? He will reveal all, and often does, <laughs> if you make it worth his while. So the emperor sent him a message saying, I have no heir, please advise. And a message came back, try massaging the scalp with camel fat. <laughs> But that very evening, the emperor heard one of his children saying, <laughs> Which means, why do they call me Mimi when my name is really Fred? <laughs> so instead of christening the child Madam Butterfly, they called him Fred Moth. <laughs> celebrated by throwing a huge banquet of leftover boiled camel and crispy noodles and everyone was delighted except the wise man who got the hump <laughs> and now it's time for our song here's one from the paddy field songbook he was an irish missionary much given to singing <laughs> Have a glass of rice wine beneath the almond tree. Rice wine is a nice wine and has more cake than tea. <laughs> oh. And we'll be very merry, you and me. Bring another bottle and pour another glass. We'll talk of Aristotle and watch the seasons pass. <gasps> Pardon. <laughs> and be careful or you'll fall, dear, flat on the grass. <laughs> when the wine is finished, we'll dance around the tree. High spirits undiminished, they won't be and sing sweet melody in Japanese. Now it's time for the Smith Report. Ah, <laughs> oh, that should go with a bang. 
May I have a fanfare, please? And you can't ask for a fairer fan than that. <laughs> Good evening. First, a close look at this week's main topic, the population explosion. What does the man in the street have to say? Oh, you parked your car on my bleeding foot. I meant about the population explosion. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've heard a lot about it, but I've never actually seen a member of the population actually explode. <laughs> Can't say I've exactly been going around looking for it, as you might say, but I do think I'd have noticed if anyone had gone bang right in front of me. <laughs> Population explosion? Well, I like the lead singer, but I can't stand that fella on the bass guitar. He's too much of an exhibitionist, always showing his teeth and flashing his plectrum all over the place. No, no, I, I was talking about the rising birth rate. Oh, I see. Well, why didn't you say so? Now, they are a lovely group. <laughs> Well, it, it's the irresponsible youth of today, and that's the cause of it. And I've, I've got one thing against their permissive society. What's that? They won't let me become a member. <laughs> so much for the opinions of the average man. But we decided that this subject was so important that it rated the opinions of one of the world's greatest experts on the subject of breeding, who is here now in the studio. Yeah, what's up, Doc? No, sir, you are, I believe, a rabbit. That's right, Doc. I'm a rabbit. <laughs> Have a carrot. No, no thanks, I don't. Oh, come on. Put it behind your ear for later. <laughs> now, as I see it, Doc, you've got no population problem. Compared to us rabbits, you humans are just a lot of lousy breeders. Your part the expression. <laughs> Take my wife and I. Oh, you're married? Yes, I met her at the Playboy Club. <laughs> she was a funny girl. <laughs> the other day, the two of us are uh, being chased across a field by a pack of hounds. Do you know what we did? No, what? We went down this hole, waited ten minutes, and then came back and surrounded them. Can the population explosion ever be controlled while our permissive society continues to titillate our sexual phagocytes? Now, these days, sex is everywhere. In advertising, for example. A million housewives every day pick up a man. Oh, should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> There's also a sexual influence in television drama. Now, take this excerpt from a recent Wednesday play. Oh, a oh, million. Million. Charles. Charles. Million. Oh, Charles. Oh. Oh, William. I told you we should have taken the lift. We come now to Problem Corner. For those of you who enjoy a good cry, here is our Problem Man of the Week. Uh, my name is Clarence J. Mouse, partner. And what's your other problem? Uh, recently, after attending a rally at Trafalgar Square, I noticed that I was leaning to the left <laughs> due to a shift in the centre of my gravity, which caused my lady wife to remark, it's like walking home with a leaning tower of peace. How oh, very hurt. Yes, it was. And now she won't be seen out with me. But if she leaned to the right, then together you'd look like the Arc de Triomphe. <laughs> now, my leaning has got so acute that I have to walk with one foot in the gutter. <laughs> Otherwise, I fall over sideways. <laughs> supposing there isn't a gutter? Uh, well, then I have to hop. <laughs> it's ruining my career. Oh, what's that? I'm a long distance runner. <laughs> Couldn't you become a long-distance hopper? No, I couldn't, no. I have decided to take up mountaineering instead. Very sensible. Yes, mm -hmm. I thought so. Of course, you realise you'll have to climb every mountain sideways. Uh, yes, that's all right, providing a mountain is facing the right way. <laughs> so I have bought some rope and provisions and a little tent, and I've put them in a rucksack, and now I've got another little problem. No, oh dear, what's that? Well, when I'm wearing the rucksack, yes. I lean backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Time now for our song spot. It gives me 
not a little pride and not a lot of pleasure to introduce the Maxi Length Harris Male Voice Choir. It's better not to open up your ear and sing. It's better not to hear the homey voices ring. Choirs. Surely, in your case, male voice choir is a bit of a misnomer. Oh, Miss Crisp, oh, straight out of the starch bucket. <laughs> I mean, there's oh. only two of you. Oh, there you are. He's noticed. <laughs> I Not told blind, you, know. I told you we couldn't handle all the parts between us. Well, what? <laughs> repertoire, the repertoire the size of mine, love. Anything is possible. Oh, <laughs> oh Miss Clever Clogs. Here, watch it. What happened at Covent Garden when you took on the nice singers, single-handed, lost your voice, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> that wasn't all I lost, either. No. No. Excuse me. Oh, oh, you're still with us. More or less. And I'd like to know what you're going to sing. Well, uh, <clears throat> how do you feel about a nice little bit of cosy van tutti? <laughs> Distinctly lukewarm. No, oh, suit yourself. Oh, I know, though, here. What? what about the transformation scene from Boris Goudinou? Oh, no, no, I'm not up to it, love. No, no, I'm not. Not chat, no. It takes a lot out of you, does it, Boris? Go on. <laughs> Force yourself. No, no, no. Go on. I've told you before, you want to brace yourself. Dur he does. <laughs> brace yourself during the till ready. Yes. <laughs> That's all very well, but there isn't any till ready with Boris. It's a quick B flat and you're off. Oh. <laughs> I don't know enough. Haven't you, haven't you anything from the top ten? Top oh. ten! <laughs> oh, we don't sing pops, love. Nothing pop. Me and my friend are strictly of a classical bent, aren't we? Strictly. <laughs> strictly, and we don't care who knows it. No. <laughs> That's lucky. Yeah. yeah. Everything from Schubert's leader to opera poof. Boof! <laughs> You're great nana. Yeah. <laughs> How about a quick snatch of Tchaikovsky? Oh, fantabulovsky. Yes. Let's give him our Swan Lake. Oh, well, all right, but don't get out of your depths. No, don't you worry yourself. <clears throat> Although we know every single note of all the things that Tchaikovsky wrote, we are going to take a very pretty thing. It is Swan Lake. It's difficult to sing. It tells the tale of a fair princess who got herself in a nasty mess. You may have heard she altered overnight into a bird, which gave her such a fright. But then one day there came along a prince to shoot some duck. He saw the princess swimming on the lake and thought she was a drake, a natural mistake. Until his friend who'd come along as well said, no such luck. What self-respecting Drake do you suppose would waddle on his toes unless he's one of those? <laughs> not, not his type of weak. They dance a lot, but they never speak. But all the same, the lallies are a dream. You're as you can. <laughs> you can say you've seen Swan Lake. <laughs> So we come to our feature, Feeble Fables, Stories with a Moral. Oh, good. There's one thing I like, it's immoral stories. I said <laughs> a moral. Well, could we have the Feeble Fable music, please? <laughs> And my story starts in the middle of an ocean almost anywhere. I say, can't you be more specific? All right, then. The specific ocean. Uh, it's one of those sort of sketches, is it? I had been a passenger on the ocean liner SS Dean Martin. A tight little ship. <laughs> and that evening, we had had dinner dancing and a shipwreck. Which was why I found myself alone on a raft. Alone. All alone except for my two male companions. One was a tall, handsome, strapping guards officer, and the other one wasn't. 
It's no good. It's no good, I tell you. We can't go on. There's not enough food for the three of us. One of us will have to dive overboard. Major, I'm a woman. That's a good enough reason. You... <laughs> no, no. It's got to be one of us chaps. And we shall decide which one of us chaps in the traditional manner that I learned at Eton. It is a method that reflects all that is best in the public school system. You mean we cast lots? No, I push you overboard. I screamed, and as the raft pulled away, I floundered and splashed, fighting for my very life until finally I drowned. <laughs> Almost. A piece of wood drifted past, marked driftwood. <laughs> and I clung to it tenaciously. Meanwhile, on a nearby desert island, don't show you're afraid, Ariadne. This man can only be the native chief. Me, on Popo. <laughs> no, please don't get up. <laughs> you shall die for breaking the sacred rule that binds all subjects of on Popo. But, but what have we done? You did that old joke about please don't get up. Oh, honest, I'm sick of it. Every time I say me on popo, someone just has to say it. Honestly, it gets on your nerves. What I mean is all the time, every day. I'm a man can only stand so much. Oh. So what was I doing? Milking the joke, dear. <laughs> You shall die. Major, put foot quickly. Show him what you've got hidden under your long plastic neck. Oh. Oh, you mean my photograph? Yes, yes, they'll think that's magic, all right. Chief on Popo, being a shipwrecked Englishman, I naturally have concealed about my person a gramophone and eight carefully selected gramophone records. King K. Watch carefully. I turn this handle. Place this arm upon the revolving disc and... Please release me, let me go. <gasps> he does indeed bring magic inside that tiny box he carries in his hand he has concealed. Engelbert Humperdinck. <laughs> Impressed by my magic, the incredulous natives made me king of the island and Ariadne my queen. They built us a house of grass, except for the smallest room, which was weed. <laughs> Funny, I still don't understand that line. We lived comfortably, happily, until one day... If you're the dustman, we've already got some. Oh, yeah, don't you remember me? Oh, yeah, long time no see. Hello. Oh boy, come in, bring your coat out. My word, what a lovely place you got here. Yes, the natives built it for us, actually. It's made entirely of grass. Grass? Yep. Oh, with every mud can you even got water wall lawn. <laughs> <laughs> this is the lounge. lounge. Here's the split level dining room. Ooh. Billiard room, and this is the nursery. Oh, you haven't got any children. No, we've been very lucky so far. <laughs> look, look here, as I'm king and she's queen, you'd better have a title too. Come upstairs and get knighted. Oh, <laughs> I beg your pardon? Knighted in the attic. Oh. Uh, that's where we store the royal thrones between state occasions. Yes, they made a solid concrete, you see, and very uncomfortable. Yes, Ariadne kept complaining that her seat was stone cold. Mm. Yes, yeah, the sound effects man. He's been eating radishes again. <laughs> no. no, it's not him, it's the attic floor. The thrones have weighed it down. Look out, we'll all be killed. <laughs> And the moral of this week's story is people who live in grass houses shouldn't stow thrones. <laughs> That was 
Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims, and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Miles Rudge and David Cumming and Derek Collier. The producer was John Simmons. Gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, and Joan Sims in. I've been rushing about showing it to everybody. <laughs> well, it's the first time I've had my name in Who's Who. Yes, I wish they hadn't listed as my main hobby as camping. <laughs> Silly, it's nice to feel... Hello, one Ken. Ha oh, hello. How are you today? Oh, I'm in heaven. I'm in Wonderland. I'm on cloud number seven. Oh, I've come in number seven. Your time's up. <laughs> <laughs> hello, Ken. Uh, hello, Joe. Hello, Hugh. Oh, crikey, they're at it again. <laughs> I brought you a little present this week, Joan. Something that would drive most women out of their minds. Oh, what is it? There. Photograph of me. Oh, it's... It's... Oh, oh what's the word I'm looking for? Hideous. <laughs> this was taken by Dalis, Britain's leading photographer. Oh, I went to him to have my theatricals done. He's a photographer, dear, not a doctor. What are you? What did you know about it? I've been there as well, you know. He captured my fragile beauty in 17 different positions. Oh, kinky. <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want you to cherish it, Joan. Keep it close to your heart. Well, yes, but I, I think I'd have a bit of trouble getting it down the front of my dress. <laughs> oh, I don't know. If you took it out of the frame and folded it up. Oh, yes. Yes, I'll do that. Oh, good. Then I can have the frame back. <laughs> it used to contain a picture of me lying naked on a bearskin rug. Oh, Hugh, how sweet. How old were you then? 23. <laughs> oh, it sounds quite, quite beautiful. But not as beautiful as you. Oh, Hugh. Oh, Joe. <laughs> oh, Douglas. <Yes. laughs> you come and rescue us before we all drown in a sea of sentimentality. Certainly. I'll uh, make an announcement. Mm, shrewd thinking. <laughs> Statistics tell us that crime is on the increase. Or could this be due to a lack of cooperation between ordinary householders and the police? Or take Sid and Rita Dipfinger, and you can't get more ordinary than that. <laughs> Say, there's something I want to ask. Oh, yeah. can't you wait, Rita? I'm just getting ready for work. No, it can't. Oh, Rita. Have you noticed how things have been disappearing recently? Well, what sort of things? Well, the front door knocker, dear, and the front door. Oh, and another thing, Rita. I was only thinking this morning coming down the stair. Surely we used to have more than one. <laughs> to seven of them, and it's worse going up. I mean, you have to jump, do you? Do you? Jumping's never been much in your line, has it? <laughs> I mean, yes, we all know what your line is. <laughs> it's not jumping. <laughs> it is not. I came to a very nasty perler just now when I went up to make the... Uh, B-E-D. <laughs> and that's another thing. No, not the B-E-D. That's not gone too. Well, not entirely. There's still four casters sitting in the middle of the floor. <laughs> oh, is that all? Well, no, not quite 
all, there's a bit of fluff out of the match, Rick. Well, I'm not spending the night on four casters and a bit of fluff. <laughs> I'll have to sleep on the sofa, I suppose. Hello. Exactly. Hello, hello. Where's the sofa? My very words when I came in to dust the telly. It meant a lot to me, that sofa. Yes, remember how we discovered that the arm let down? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't stop me, I can't. Ah, ah, ah. No, but seriously, Sid, oh, shouldn't we tell the police? I mean, pop into the station on your way to work. Don't worry, Lisa, I'm going to. I've just noticed something else. What's that? They've pinched my blooming Jimmy as well. <laughs> To Cracker Jack and Ollie with Mother Time. And with another of her far flung tales from far flung lands, here is far flung Maud Nethersoul. Hello, Tinies, and Biggies, too. Long ago in old Heidelberg, which at that time was quite new, there lived a kindly old watchmaker called Fritz Amadeus Wolfgang Furtwangler von Harris. His friends called him Old Pretzel Whiskers. <laughs> he had an enormous shop. He needed it to get his name over the door. <laughs> and he always wore lederhosen, which creaked when he sat down. Well, that was his story, and he was sticking to it. <laughs> well, one day, when he was trying to fix a cuckoo clock which had gone broody, <laughs> a small boy came into his shop, and his name was Rudy, though his friends called him Rude, which he was. <laughs> Very. He shouted a lot, and he wore a woolly hat with a pom-pom on the top, which was absolutely filthy, for reasons I'd rather not go into. <laughs> Suffice to say, he was on his way home from milking a goat. The poor little chap had been trying to mend his wrist watch with an alpenstock, unsuccessfully, as it turned out. <laughs> this he explained to the watchmaker, saying, Ach, so, said the kindly watchmaker. Idly plucking an idle vice which happened to be growing in his beard. <laughs> in fact, he had many vices, but his favourite one was an idle one. <laughs> and uh, fumbling in the pocket of his lederhosen, he said to Rudy, Hef eine pretzel, or better still, have eine idle weisel. <laughs> Fire paddy tat! <laughs> shouted Rudy rudely. And then what do you think? The cuckoo clock started to strike, and the cuckoo came out and laid an egg right on Rudy's pom-pom. <laughs> so he went back to milking his goat and was never rude again. He even bought a pair of lederhosen for his goat, and that's why Gruyere cheese is full of holes. <laughs> but now it's time for our song. Here's one I learned from a skiing instructor who was called Hans, and I soon discovered why. <laughs> we'll climb up the mountain one morning in spring, and when we get up there, we'll sit down and sing, and we'll yodel old lay so loud and so clear, unless, of course, you've got a better idea. <laughs> Lunches up there on the peak. We may stay a day or we may stay a week with a yodel on lay beneath the blue sky. Can you hear the echo? No, neither can I. Oh, some people say their favorite things are whiskers on kittens and parcels with strings. But a yodel on lay is such a delight. Don't you think so too? 
to our feature, Feeble Fable. This week's story with a model is set in Egypt and opens in a sleazy hotel in Cairo. Yes, Bedouin and breakfast, 30 <laughs> My name is Professor Waterman. I was sitting at the bar, hitting the bottle. And it's the only way with tomato ketchup. <laughs> Suddenly, a suspicious-looking little man sidled up to me. <laughs> I beg your pardon. You want, you want to buy some filthy postcards? No, thank you. I've already written home. <laughs> no, I have really different, unusual pictures of a mermaid. Well, what's so different about a mermaid? The top half is the fish. <laughs> Let me see. Very good. <laughs> oh, very oh, good, yes. Oh. oh, my word, I'll take every coffee you've got. Oh. These are absolutely... Oh, no, uh, Professor. Absolutely disgraceful. Go away. <laughs> Who was that? Oh, just someone from the pawn shop. <laughs> Get on the plot, my dear. My name is Lady Sunderwear. Lady Felicity Sunderwear. Personal assistant to the Professor. Today is the day we plan to set forth across the desert to find the tomb of Tutankhamun, and having found it, remove his mortal remains and transport them back to the British Museum. Oh, good. That's got that over. Give us a kiss. <laughs> Excuse me. Did I hear you mention Tutankhamun? Yes, what of it? Well, it's just that I know where it is. You do? Yes, it's like the road from Clapham Carmen. <laughs> A guide, Professor. Yes. Shall we ask this man to join us? Oh, very well. Oh, good. We can all get together and make an expedition of ourselves. <laughs> Two hours later, our intrepid explorers set out in the heat of the noonday sun, with nobody to see them off except three mad dogs and Noel Coward. <laughs> Two days later, they had reached their destination, the pyramids. Forward to the tomb of Tutankhamun. Felicity, we're through. And I'm frightened, Professor. Frightened of what we might find inside the tomb. What dreadful thing we might see. <gasps> Hello. <laughs> oh, I've sweated for three hours to get this tomb open. How did you get in here? They left the back door open. <laughs> well, what were you doing round there? <laughs> Nothing. There wasn't one. <laughs> I found it! I found it! Oh, thank heavens for that. <laughs> the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun. Ooh. Here, take this tool and have the honour of opening it. <laughs> oh, it's oh. Yes, all right. I'm opening it now. Felicity, we're too late. You mean? Yeah, he's dead. <laughs> Felicity, listen. You know what that means? Yes, it means that a bolt of lightning is about to strike anyone dead who remains in the tomb after it's opened. The curse of the pharaohs. Make the entrance, quick. But it's jammed shut. <laughs> Guess who remembered the back door was open? <laughs> and so it fell to me to get the remains of Tutankhamen to the British Museum. And on their very doorstep, three weeks later... Yeah, you won't believe it, but this coffin contains the remains of Tutankhamun. I've carried it on foot to Cairo, by sea to Naples, by air to Gatwick, and by southern region to Victoria Station. Coffin? 
What coffee? Yeah. Oh dear, I left it on the tube. <laughs> Taken 5,000 years to find it, and after three weeks you lost it, you idiot. Yes, and the moral of this week's story is a fool and his mummy are soon parted. <laughs> Problem corner. And to remind us that a stitch in time will probably do no good at all, here is our problem man of the week. And my name is Clarence J. Mouse Partner, and my life has become a living hell on account of the supersonic bang. Don't you I move have more slowly. Finished. <laughs> <laughs> We're allergic to bang. And who can blame you? For the past six months, we have all been sitting with our fingers stuffed in our ears. <laughs> well, I mean, that's no life for a growing kiddie, is it? No, it certainly isn't. He'd have to eat with his feet. Yes. <laughs> it makes family life very difficult. There are some things you can't do at all with your fingers stuffed in your ears. <laughs> several... Several spring to mind. I think I'll just leave them there. And speaking personally... Oh, must you? It's a great handicap in my work. Which is what? A piano tuner. <laughs> no joke, tuning a piano with your elbow. You leave very sensitive elbows. Yes. However, I have partially solved the problem by having me and my loved ones fitted with earplugs. You're very sensible. Pardon? Very sensible! Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, we have another little problem. Oh, dear. Yes. Now we're all able to remove our fingers from our ears. Yes. Just can't think what to do with our hands. <laughs> Once again, we flood the air with melody, brought to you by the rich, resonant voices of the Maxi Length Harris Male Voice Choir. It's better not to open up your ear and sing. It's better not to hear the Obi voices ring. who appreciate a bit of the genuine art. And none of your pop rubbish, Ducky. Oh, no, we no. are your actual classical ensemble. Yes, two no. homies who know the score. No. <laughs> Shortly to be seen appearing at the Albert oh. Hall in person. person. By person. arrangement with the door key. Right, <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, I thought oh. you'd gone home. Did you really say you were to appear at the Albert Hall, or did my ears deceive you? Mm, well, they're certainly big enough to have a mind of their own. <laughs> Of course we're about to appear there, Chuck. Well, which prom are you appearing at? I must remember to leave the country. Oh, oh no. We're not actually appearing at the prom, love. No. No, we're going to be a curtain raiser for the wrestlers. Wrestlers? Oh, no. You're quite sure the wrestlers will want you to raise their curtains? Oh, no. Oh, Miss Smart, straight out of the dress shop. Of course they will. Mm. We've been rehearsing a new piece special. Mm. Would you like to hear it? I was hoping you'd never ask. Oh. What is it? Beethoven's Fifth. In Toto? No, in C. Toto. Have you got the key? Yes, I'm a charm bracelet. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. yeah, well, give it a bang and we're off. <laughs> Beethoven's Fifth. <laughs> Beethoven's Fifth. The work begins with violins played rather slow To give it class, he adds the brass fortissimo Then comes a tune that you can hum Though it's more difficult than some And then away we go <laughs> Beethoven's feast Are you all right? Oh, I think so. <laughs> Lucky I'm wearing my flatties. <laughs> Beethoven's fifth. What are you doing down there? Go on. 
on, Beethoven's fifth. If you ask me, Ludwig von B knew what was what. He'd work for days upon a phrase as like as not. And if it sounded rather nice, he'd say, I think I'll have it twice. And that is why we've gone. <laughs> Beethoven's fifth. <laughs> Lovely duck. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm afraid I'm not up to the pizzicato today. <laughs> Never mind, cut to the third movement. Right. Maybe you've heard Beethoven's third frequently done. So's number one and two and all the rest. But we like best. Beethoven. Here, how many more movements? <laughs> Big flash finish, hey. they were home and dry. And oh, what wit to christen it. Time for the Smith Report. Another mixed bag of Smith's quips. <laughs> I do wish you wouldn't say things like that. The Smith Report. <laughs> the television industry. What does the man in the street have to say? Well, I think there's too much violence on television. Only last night it was this fella rolling about on the floor, holding his stomach in agony and screaming with pain. And that was only a commercial for fruit salts. <laughs> the telly, well, you know, it's a funny thing, but my husband and I, we was watching the television when our youngest, our two-year-old Jimmy, said his very first words... And what were they? Shut up! I'm watching Peyton Place! <laughs> Commercials on television are becoming as popular as the programme. The next thing we can expect is a top ten for commercial jingles. Hi there, politicals. Straight into number five comes Pearson's Petticoats with their hit jingle, There's many a slip twixt stress and draw. <laughs> Still at number four, United We Stand, divided we fall by the British Bra Foundation. <laughs> Up 16 places this week to a fantastic number three tent pole toilet preparations with if you don't use our deodorant, please use our soap. <laughs> and here it is, this week's number one, this week's top of the shops. I'm in your house right every day. Pick up a can of beans and say, Well, what do you expect on the housekeeping you give me, caviar? <laughs> Finally, what of television in the future? It follows that local radio will be superseded by local television. Perhaps so local that each house will be its own station, producing its own television programmes. Programmes like News at 10, Acacia Road. And here's your newscaster, Roger the Lodger. <laughs> Good evening. Yesterday's flare-up between Mr Bromsgrove and his wife Alice resulted in deadlock this afternoon. Mrs. Bromsgrove has locked herself in the bedroom, causing housewide chaos. <laughs> the outcome so far has been a pile of dirty dishes in the kitchen sink and bread and margarine for supper. Sport. Here is the result of the Snakes and Ladders match between Grandpa and ten-year-old <laughs> Snakes five, Ladders three. And now, variety time. Yes, Sunday night in the scullery. And here he is, the star of our show, 12-year-old Jimmy Bromsgrove. <laughs> Well, go on, keep on with it. Keep uh, on with it. Uh, uh, I wish there was a little fish underneath the ice. Uh, when the little girls come by, oh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> and now for this week's drama, over to the old stand, where Mr Bromsgrove is waiting at the foot of the stairs. <laughs> Shirley? What are you doing with that suitcase? Don't try and stop me, Daddy. I'm leaving home. Why, sure? I'm in the family's way. <laughs> You're what? I'm just a nuisance to you, Daddy. You don't understand young people. Please, let me pass. Where will you go? I don't know. Sydney's coming to pick me up on his motorbike. <laughs> oh, I think that's him now. Yes, that's him. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> Sorry, Cheryl. 
come here to break up a happy home and pluck my daughter from the bosom of her family. No, I'll just come take her pictures. At three o'clock in the morning? Well, you might miss the second feature. Don't but... lie to me. <laughs> I know your type. Shirley, he's taking you to some far-off place to have his way with you. Well, last time we tried it here, it kept on waking you up. <laughs> Come on, sure. I've left the engine running. Shirley, wait! <laughs> Am I to blame for you being like me? No, it's not really you, Daddy. It's Mother. Your mother? Yes, she's always prying into my affairs, wants to know where I've been and who I've been with. She won't let me smoke or drink or stay out late. And when I do, she keeps on at me. Nag, nag, nag! Sydney! Yes? Have you got one for two in your pillion? <laughs> <laughs> Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Miles Rudge and David Cumming and Derek Collier. Producer was John Simmons. Well, all right, then. It's some special day. No, no, I've tried to remember. It's not our wedding anniversary. It's not your birthday, and it's not the twins' birthday. It's not Valentine's Day, and it's not Mother's Day. I give up. You'll have to tell me. All right, then. Here's your present. Happy Christmas! <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, and Joan Sims in... <laughs> Stop messing about. Oh, hello and welcome. Well, there's lots I'd like to tell you about this week, but the producer said to me, he said, go on out there and talk to them, but don't hang it out. As if I would. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not one to elongate my introductions. <laughs> no. Well, I'm not in public anyway. I really. Hello, Ken. Hello, Ken. Oh, we're there again. Love's young dream. You're looking very pleased with yourselves today. Well, yes, Ken, because last night was our first time. Oh! <laughs> we went to see Dr. Zhivago together. Oh, what did he say? Good news, I hope. <laughs> We went to see the film. Oh. It was our first date. Oh, gives you the EBG business, oh. doesn't it? Oh, I don't suppose you watched the film. I saw everything. Mm, that's as may be, but what was the film about? <laughs> well, um... Come on, Dr. Shivago, what was it about? Uh... Uh, Russia. <gasps> Is that all you remember? No, 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 no. There was this girl, this Russian peasant, about to be executed by the Tsar, and two iced lollies danced on and offered themselves for nine pence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was the interval. Well, I know, but we had to look at that bit. The lights came up. <gasps> and to think David Lean spent four years making that film. Four years? Four years. He directed also one of my... Greatest successes, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Carry on, Lawrence of Arabia, you know. <laughs> oh, yes, I've worked with them all. Oh, I have. Jo yes, John Houston. John Houston. <laughs> Carol Reed. Lovely girl. <laughs> As a right matter there. of fact, well, I am planning to make a film. You're based, doing a film? Yes, mm. based on the book of the River Kwai. The, they've already done a film about the River Kwai. Uh, yes, but this is the unabridged version. <laughs> I was in Birth of a Nation. I know, dear. You ran to fetch the hot water. <laughs> Douglas, 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 for heaven's sake, come and rescue us before the films and the jokes get any older. My <laughs> sentiments exactly, Mr. Williams. Mm. 
In spite of recent pay rises, many homes in Britain are feeling the pinch of rising costs, and nowhere is the pinch felt more frequently than in the home of Sid and Rita Dipfinger. While I'm eating, Rita, time and a place for everything. No, no, I'm worried about the rising cost of living, oh, dear. Oh, I... The fact <laughs> is, you see, our ingoings don't balance up with our outcomings. Is <laughs> oh, a fact, Rita? Oh, pass the champagne. I'm just about ready for my second cup. Well, exactly, champagne. I mean, couldn't you make do with a nice bottle of Bow Jollies? Bow Jollies? <laughs> I can't drink bow jollies with caviar. It's the wrong colour. Well, not if I cooked it a different way, dear. <laughs> Boiled it up with a bit of onion. I certainly don't want to drink boiled bow jollies. Well, I meant the caviar, dear. Oh. There must be some way of making it into a shepherd's pie. <laughs> and as for last week's green grocery bill, see what could we possibly have done with 73 pineapples. <laughs> yes, I don't know. The mind boggles. <laughs> well, whatever it was, I hope we enjoyed it. <laughs> So I think you ought to ask the boss for a ride. You're right, Rita. After all, I have been there for nearly a week. Well, exactly. I mean, tell him your take-home money just isn't enough to manage I it. I will, but there is just one snag, Rita. What's that, Sid? Well, they don't know at the bank that I'm taking money home. <laughs> It's Cracker Jack and Ori with Mother Time. And here with arms akimbo and quite a lot else besides is Mary Maud Nethersell. Hello, Tinies and Biggies too. Have you ever wondered what Eskimos do during the long, dark winter? <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> They tell each other stories. So here's one that's been going round the Arctic Circle for years. Once there was a little seal called Geoffrey who desperately wanted to play the post horn gallop on his motor horn. He was very well connected. His uncle was Lord Privy Seal. But though he was well connected, his motor horn wasn't. And when he got to the bit with all the tan tivies, his bulb always fell off. <laughs> so he said to his mother, Why am I not if I had a bubble fall off? I know, dear, said his mother. It's frightfully difficult not to lose one's bulb during a tan tivy. Why not stick it on with a bit of blubber? Well, as you know, blubber comes from whales. So Geoffrey set off for Aberystwyth. <laughs> with his precious instrument tied up in a spotted red handkerchief. <laughs> Presently he met a short-sighted husky dog who just had a spine-chilling experience. He'd mistaken the North Pole for a tree. <laughs> said Geoffrey. <laughs> and the husky dog told him, huskily, what had happened. And Geoffrey cried so much that his tears made a hole in the ice. And there was a beautiful whale called Blodwin. <laughs> well, Blodwin gave Geoffrey more blubber than he knew what to do with. So now the three of them have teamed up into a most successful trio the three Eskimo Nellies. <laughs> Jeffrey plays the horn, the husky tells shaggy dog stories with a difference, and Blodwin squirts. <laughs> but now for our song. Here's one I learned in the frozen north whilst parking my icicle. <laughs> Though life on the whole around the North Pole certainly got its force. There's a little 
igloo where we both can do the Aurora Borealis waltz. In warm woolly drawers, we'll both take the floor for a bit of Icelandic schmaltz. Do what Eskimos do, we'll rub noses to the Aurora Borealis waltz. With a tiny oil lamp to keep out the damp, the merriment never holds. So say you'll be mine at wick dreaming time in the Aurora Borealis Woods. And so we come to our feature, Feeble Fables, stories with a model. I saw if he stopped messing about. <laughs> Sort of, yes. <laughs> and our story with the model this week is set in Chicago during the time of the Prohibition. Known as the You Can't Do That There era. My name is Wall, Walter Wall. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be in the carpet business. <laughs> I've made a pile. <laughs> So, when Prohibition started, I opened a speakeasy on the east side. I also had one on the west side, but that's another story. Okay, I'll get it. Boss! Boss! I got terrible news! It's been cut off! Oh, I am sorry. Our, our liquor supply! There'll be no more booze. The entire bootlegging syndicate has been wiped out, including gang boss Seltz Apone and his brother Alka. Yeah, another joke like that and you'll be wiped out. No, oh, but boss, boss, we're down to our last case of booze. After that, we've only got your carpet cleaner. No, we need the real stuff. Get on the phone to the West Side Syndicate run by Babyface Nelson's little brother. Ah, uh, who's that? Would you believe Babyface Half Nelson? <laughs> I'm a mall. I was in the bathroom showing Babyface my black bottom when the phone rang. He squared his massive shoulders, picked up the receiver and said... Hello? Bootleg boutique? Yes, we deliver COD. And if you want something to drink with a cod, we'll deliver G-I-N as well. Yeah, right, got that. I've got some brewing in the bath right now. Remember our motto, not a drop is sold till it's 20 minutes old. Who was that? Wall to wall. And then he's up here. But that's east side. You can't go to the east side tonight. The cops are watching your every move. I know. Hardly blame them, can you? <laughs> Twenty-five years, don't you? Do you want to wind up a broken old man? I'll try anything once. Ah, <laughs> oh, what's the use? Look, look here. Don't, don't fret yourself. I've come up with a solution to our delivery problems. I've bought us a funeral wagon. A what? A hearse. We hide all the bottles in the coffin and just drive across town. Oh, that's a stupid idea, baby face. No. no wonder they always call you by your initials. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. Now hurry up. If you're going to come with me, you'll have to dress for the part. Have you got anything black you can put on? Why, well, yeah, but ain't I going to look a bit funny sitting there in a hat of veil on my underwear? <laughs> As we drove across town, we realised that the funeral wagon was one of the greatest ideas I'd ever had. Even the cops had to take their hats off to us. <laughs> Finally, we reached our destination, Walter's Place. Gee, babyface, how'd you get here so quickly? Don't you have trouble with the fuzz? No, I only have to shave once every three days. <laughs> Well, having brought all the stuff here, all this way, I guess you need a drink. Hmm. Oh, thanks very much. I'll have a small... 
large enormous thank you um, anything will it? Mm, back it of water I should think <laughs> um, how about you little lady? well small one because it's funny with me and booze one drink i hardly feel two drinks i begin to feel it three drinks and anybody I know, I know. <laughs> oh, thank you, dear. well yeah well uh, uh, yeah what about you walter what about you walter aren't you gonna have one uh, no thanks i don't oh no. come on to celebrate our working together i tell you i never touch the stuff oh please no and the moral of this week's story is, you can take a hearse to Walter, but you cannot make him drink. <laughs> problem caller. And in it, almost ready to throw in the towel, is our problem man of the week. Uh, my name is Clarence J. Mouse Partner, and I have a problem of a very personal nature. Oh, I am sorry. I haven't finished. <laughs> personal nature on account of I suffer from claustrophobia of the feet. <laughs> Just of the feet? Well, that's enough, isn't it? <laughs> no, I, I meant, you, couldn't you wear shoes of a bigger size? Uh, no, I, I dare, daresn't wear shoes at all. Well, it's very difficult for getting around, isn't it? It is, it is, yes. For instance, I suffer torments when travelling on a crowded train. I have to shove my feet out of the carriage window. <laughs> They get all smutty. <laughs> and the tunnels, the tunnels are ever so painful. <laughs> Agony. Well, don't the other passengers complain? Oh, no, 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 they take it in very good part. Though people getting in sometimes make hurtful remarks. <laughs> you can hardly blame them. It's not very nice to be face to face with a smutty foot. No, no, I suppose it's not really. No, no. And recently my feet have been holding me back in my chosen profession. Which is what? I'm a halfback for Tottenham Hotspur. <laughs> <laughs> One little dribble and I'm in agony. That's why I have decided to become a librarian in a nudist camp. Ah, very sensible. Yeah. You'll not only be footloose, but fancy free as well. <laughs> How true that is. Yeah. It helped me with my claustrophobia, but now I've got another little problem. Oh dear, what? Well, um, <clears throat> do you know what agoraphobia is? Yes, fear of open spaces. Yes, well now I'm suffering from that. Only higher up. <laughs> Time now for our song spot. We again bring you the maxi length Harris male voice choir. It's Bona to open up your ear and sing. It's Bona to hear the Obi voices ring. In harmony. from a couple of homies who know how to handle a vocal. Excuse me. Oh, hello. I thought you trolled off home. I did. No, I've trolled back. Oh! Oh, Miss Cutie Pie. Oh, <laughs> Straight off the good ship lollipop. <laughs> I'd like to know what you're going to sing. Well, it's funny you should mention trolling, cos today's offering is all about trolls. Careful, Becky. It... <laughs> it's from Greeks. Pia Gint. Mind your P's and Q's. <laughs> oh, Pia Gint. You see, I've got it right. Only just. Hey. <laughs> Don't risk her like a third time. Oh, it is a lovely piece. Oh, lovely. It's about the bit where all the little trolls come down the mountain. Yes, where well, they've been up trolling all night. Trolling. <laughs> they end up in the hall of the Mountain Queen. King! <laughs> King! You are a fool. Honestly, can't take you anywhere. Can't take You've you never anywhere. asked me, do you? Well, it's a disgraceful way you carry on. Well, I get Put yourself together. Put yourself together. Flummoxed. Keep on picking on me all the time. Pick, 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 pick. Pick it. Like being surrounded by the seven dwarfs. Eh? You're no Snow White ducky. <laughs> um, can, could we return to trolling down the mountain? Oh, it's getting the Polari. Oh, quick as a flash <laughs> chuck. Yes. yes May as well yes. get up in it, though. That's the way they fall into they it. They do. Yeah. I meant your song. Oh, suit yourself. Go on, announce us. Right, right. We proudly present the first public performance of the trolling song. From a gint called Pier. <laughs> 
Visualize a troll who is all alone, feeling miss. All the other trolls have gone and left him on his top. Oh, poor little Omi, they've <laughs> trolled off and left him. Yes, all oh. their life that those trolls tickle. Oh, I could tell you a troll tailor too. Yeah, well, don't. Just get on with the song. Get on with the song. So, because he's feeling bored, takes a boat up the fjord. And to help to pass the time, he takes his fishing rod. He slings his hook. Splosh! Splosh, Chuck, and not an even a nibble. Then he sees a maiden fair on the shore, standing there, combing out her golden hair. Name of Solveig. Combing out her eye, she is. Nice. Mm. So he rows his boat ashore, she's been there an hour or more, getting fed up waiting for a fella named Greek. Greek. Greek, I thought she was waiting for Pia Geek. No, 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 chat. No, it's Greek she's really after, but he stood her up. Ah, oh, poor old Pallone. Yeah. <laughs> nice for a troll, though. So he welcomes her aboard. They go right up the fjord. And what happens afterwards isn't fit to print. <laughs> you may say, well, fancy Greek standing up, poor soul Vig. But the reason is he's very busy with Pia Gint. Busy? Is he? Busy as a beaver, love no time to take his holes. Very busy, looking for an ending to the saga of the trolls. That's it! <laughs> now it's time for the Smith Report. But first, tell us some late football results. <laughs> Chelsea won, Arsenal lost. <laughs> West Ham United four, rather I'm against. <laughs> Manchester City eight, Millwall drank. <laughs> East Fife, Fife. And Hackleton Agmadamical, uh, Hamilton, Hamilton Adeninicals, uh, Hamilton Adam Ad <laughs> Hamilton Academicals is very difficult to say. <laughs> So, to the Smith Report and our investigation into depth into this week's main topic, travel. Does it get you anywhere? What does the man in the street have to say? I always travel by underground. It makes me late for work every day. And why is that? Well, there's a notice on the escalator that said dogs must be carried. Sometimes it takes me hours to find one. <laughs> I love to travel. Last year I went on a camping holiday with my boyfriend. Just me, him and one tent. And how far did you go? Oh, not half as far as he would have liked to. <laughs> so much for public opinion, but what are the views of an expert? Greater efforts than ever before are being made to encourage tourists to travel to Britain. Oh, I've taken over recently as head of the British Tourist Board, and quite frankly, I think we've been going about it the wrong way. I mean, look at our advertising. Beautiful Britain awaits you. Please come to beautiful Britain. Damn it, these are foreigners we're dealing with. You don't ask foreigners, you tell them. <laughs> For all they understand. So I've had new posters printed saying, Come to Britain, all you crafty foreigners. Get up off your backsides. <laughs> Pull your fingers out and get over here and run away. Come to a decent country or I'll have your guts for garters. <laughs> that should do the trick. I'll be over here in swarms. And then perhaps there'll be more room on the beach for me and my wife in Monte Carlo. <laughs> Perhaps it's worth noting that no matter how much people travel around the world, they still retain the accents and attitudes of the place where they were born. Oh, I do agree. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and I've found that no matter where us American girls travel, it's almost impossible to get us to drop our drolls. <laughs> I am in complete disagreement. I have found that wherever I travel, I speak perfectly. The accent and the grammar of the country to which I am traveling to. <laughs> Here in England, I speak to people and they think I am an Englishman. Surely there's just a trace of accent? What do you know, you fine horn? We are asking the question. <laughs> One of the 
problems of travel is finding yourself alone in a railway carriage with a person who insists on talking to you. Hey, yeah. Ian. Uh, pardon? I've been staring at you all the way, all the way from Parsons Green. Yes, I've noticed. And I've been thinking there's someone who looks lonely, unhappy and friendless and would benefit from a kind word from a fellow human being. I'm really quite happy, thank you, reading my book. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're quite right. I know just how you feel. I can't stand it either with someone sitting in a train, quietly reading, and, and someone starts talking to me. Oh, it drives me mad. It really does. It's right on my nose. I just sit there and they keep nattering on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. It's the intrusion of privacy, I think. A person's right to privacy should be respected. Don't you? I said, don't you? Yes. Yeah, quite right, quite right. And the thing some of these people say, so personal. I don't think it's right for one person to say personal things about another person. I mean, I wouldn't sit here and say, you are flat-chested, even though you are. <laughs> I wouldn't say it. You tried exercises. <laughs> I read in a magazine once, you can build up your bust in less than 14 days by doing exercises. You want to try it? A bit more on top and your legs wouldn't look so fat. <laughs> I've always said that some girls can wear short skirts and, and some girls can't. You look better in a maxi with those legs. Yeah, that's a maxi skirt with an neck sweater and a sack over your head. <laughs> No, don't be like that. After all, we're on our honeymoon. <laughs> that was Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Miles Rudge and David Cumming and Derek Collier. The producer was John Simmons. Open this general meeting of the Noise Abatement Society. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, and Joan Sims in. No, stop messing about. <laughs> I must tell you, if I appear a little fraught, it's because I've just had a bit of a ding-dong with the producer. And uh, Kenny. I, hello. Uh, what, oh, what's the matter with you? Well, I, I've had a quarrel with you. My lover's tip. Well, don't cry. Your mascara's running down your cheeks. <laughs> oh, you look like a mint humbug. Well, I can't help it. Oh, here, take a page of my script. Have a good blow. No, no, I'm all right. Oh, why did I let him do it? Oh. <laughs> oh, so that's what it's all about, is it? It most certainly is not. Ah, the villain enters stage left. He speaks. You may tell Miss Sims that if she wishes to speak to me, it must be through an intermediary. What's that, some sort of megaphone? <laughs> Please tell Mr Paddock that I'm sorry that I still love him and I, I want to make it up. 
Mr. Paddock, Miss Sim says that she'll never forgive you and she never wants to speak to you again. <laughs> Please inform Miss Sims that I accept her apology, that I love her and I also want to make it up. Miss Sims, Mr. Paddock says that you have a face like the back of a tram and if he never ever sees you again, it'll be too soon, you ugly old rat bag. <laughs> trying to do? Break up a beautiful relationship? Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, Hugh. Oh, Joan. <laughs> we won't let him come between us. The way you two are standing at the moment, there wouldn't be much room, would there? We'll never have another row, darling, ever. No, it's all my fault. No, no, it was my fault. No, darling, it was my fault. No, really, it was my fault. If I say it was my fault, it was my fault! It was my fault and there is no need to shout! I am not shouting! Why must you always be so stubborn? Be stubborn? What about you? Oh, now he's calling me names again! Yeah, I've another place to be stripped. <laughs> Women! You've been listening to this week's instalment of War and Peace, episode <laughs> one, War. Douglas, Douglas, getting quick with an announcement before they decide to make it up and start on over again. Certainly, Mr. Williams. See how this, as they say, turns you on. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, it's possible to have package deal holidays in almost any corner of the globe. <laughs> My globe hasn't got any corners. <laughs> well, bully for you. <laughs> But some people find it difficult to change the holiday habits of a lifetime. For example, take Sid and Rita Dipfinger. Sid? Don't you think we ought to try somewhere new this year? Oh, but Rita, they always do us very well at Bell Rivage. <laughs> <laughs> Know our little ways. Yeah. Well, so I should hope, and after 25 years, I could do with a bit of a change, dear. Yeah, well, come to that soap of the tablecloth at Beau Rivage. <laughs> Last summer, it still had that ketchup stain from our honeymoon. Oh, oh that was a night oh, oh, oh. Uh, Second helpings of everything. Oh. Oh. And the lucky horseshoe in the egg custard. <laughs> oh, a confetti everywhere. <laughs> oh, but the thing is, Sid, I've been looking at this brochure. How about this? Pony trekking through the scenic splendours of New Zealand. Visit the sulphur springs and geysers of Rotorua. Well, if it's geysers you're after, there's... There's a lovely one in the bathroom at Bowery <laughs> Well, they haven't got sulphur springs, though, have they? I wouldn't be too sure. <laughs> if you'd like to fag on the landing, it blows up in your face. <laughs> yes, of course, there's always the Gobi Desert, see? Oh, no, no, Rita. Mrs Wallace opposite went there. She sent us the card last year. I didn't like the look of her old tell at all. Well, it was right on the beach. Sid. It was right on the beach, but where was the sea? <laughs> <laughs> she had that nasty experience sharing a room with a camel. Yes, well, of course. If I'd been her, I'd have put the light out before I got undressed. <laughs> well, if you'd been her, I expect the camel would have put the light out for you. <laughs> make a reservation soon or everywhere will be booked up. Oh, well, I don't think you can be Beau Rivage, Rita. With any luck, we'll get the room with the window. Well, I'd better write off at once, Sid. What's the address? Beau Rivage Marine Drive, Bermuda. <laughs> It's time now for Cracker Jack and Ori with Mother. And here, fresh as a May morning and bursting out all over like June, is Bunch Sigmore Nethersell. Hello, Tinies, and Biggies too. 
<laughs> Yesterday, at my local library, I picked up something fascinating. <laughs> the head librarian showed me a book on Irish folklore written by an Irish folk lawyer. And here is one of its... Here is one of its many jolly tales. There was once a leprechaun called Seamus who was terribly careless with his shillelagh. <laughs> he kept on losing it. And as you may know, a leprechaun without his shillelagh is like a bell without a clapper. No damned use to anyone. <laughs> he stormed out of the house and all at once he met a Cornish pixie called Edna, who was walking from Land's End to John O'Groats and had taken the wrong turning at Chalfont St. Giles. <laughs> Foolishly, she had asked a plastic gnome the way, and he'd led her up the garden. Hello, said Edna. I've lost my way. To which Seamus replied, Forget it, my boss had decided. Oh, how awful, said Edna. Perhaps I can help you find it. And from her pixie bosom, she produced a crystal ball. This was a <laughs> This was a great relief to Seamus. <laughs> As he thought things seemed a bit one-sided. <laughs> Conversation wise. <laughs> Suddenly she saw Seamus's shillelagh in full colour. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never believe this. He was sitting on it. <laughs> well, how did that grab you, Tinies? <laughs> oh, well, anyway, uh, here's a little Irish folk song about a goat, which is sung <laughs> by the little Irish folk. I bought a nanny goat, its name was Mother Riley. It had a shaggy coat, which smelt extremely highly, but I liked it. I washed it in the stream, it needed several washes. It threw me on my back and nibbled my galoshes, but I liked it, I quite liked it. I dried it with a towel, and though it may sound silly, I found me nanny goat was actually a billy. Oh, I sold it, but I miss it, cause I liked it. <laughs> So we come to our regular feature, Feeble Fables, Stories with a Moral. This week our setting is the Industrial North, as distinct from the Bone Idol South. <laughs> Could we have some trouble at mill music, please? <laughs> My name is Edgar Rice Pudding. <laughs> I'm one of the Yorkshire Puddings. Many historic buildings here in Twitley are associated with the family name of Pudding, like the square, the library and the club. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I own a construction kit company, DIT Limited. Do it the self. <laughs> we make kits for everything. Stop talking to the self, Edgar. And try to remember today's the day that young Chaley, your son, comes home from the University of London. Aye, Granny. I never dreamed that an ignorant man like me would one day be the father of a college pudding. <laughs> <laughs> Any minute now we'll walk through that door, a fine strapping young lad, poised and polished. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Great jumping J.B. Priestley. <laughs> what does he look like? Lavender velvet jacket, flared trousers. And what's that hanging down in front? <laughs> it's me, Dingle Dangle. <laughs> well, Father, I'm back ready to help you run the factory and have my seat on the board. The only board your seat will be on is a bench in the workers' canteen. Pardon? You'll start out floor with girls and work yourself up. <laughs> my name is Emily Moore. 
I'm one of the Yorkshire moors. <laughs> I work for the puddings at the Do It The Self Limited and I've been at it since I was 16. <laughs> so have most of the other girls up our street, but that's another story. <laughs> I started in the nut and bolt section as a bolter. Then I became a nutter. <laughs> so they transferred me to the dispatch department sent me packing, so to speak. <laughs> I'd waited three years for Chaley to return, and when he walked into the packing department that Monday morning... Chaley! Oh, why, it's Emily, my childhood sweetheart. Oh, you remember! Yeah, mixed infants. <gasps> when I used to tie your plaits together and then hang you up a tree. <laughs> well, we're here to work. You better show me how to do it. Well, we're packing kits for do-it-the-self baths this week. Oh. All you have to remember is, it's one bath, two taps, four legs and a plug. Oh, I think I've got it. I'll tell you what, I'll take a bath and let you watch. Oh, nice. <laughs> and so I started work. On and on I worked, clawing my way to reach my goal. On and on, until at last that moment came. The golden moment that I've been working for, praying for, striving for. Tea break. <laughs> it's all right, everyone. It's Saturday. I've only come to see how my lad is making out. Well, he's made out so far, I'll tell you that, Mr Pudding. That's not true. I've made two parcels. One's been sent off already. And what about the other? Not during working hours. <laughs> the other parcel. Oh, yeah, that's nearly finished. But I, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's nearly finished, but I can't get hold of any legs. Ah, not for the ones are trying, as far as mine are concerned. <laughs> but there's plenty of legs up there. No, I'm, I'm, no. I'm, 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 they've all gone. Well, I packed all those into my first parcel. One bath, two taps, 400 legs and a plug. Oh, no, Chaley. 400 of them? All gone in one do-it-yourself outfit? You're fired, you great twit. And the moral of this week's story is, don't put all your legs into one bath kit. <laughs> Problem Corner. Once again, we cross to the gloomy side of the street and meet our Problem Man of the Week. My name is Clarence J. Mouse, partner, <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid... There's I, no need I, to I, I, I haven't finished. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid my problem has to do with... sex. <laughs> may, may I speak frankly? Of course. Speak a bit louder as well. <laughs> yes, I'll try, I'll, I'll try. You see, the truth of the matter is I'm sexually attractive to birds. <laughs> well, that isn't a problem. It is when they're the sort with feathers and wings. <laughs> they, they, they keep following me home. <laughs> making provocative noises. And, um... Oh, not only that, they wiggle their tail feathers at me. <laughs> Pigeons are the worst. They always are. Uh, mind you, them starlings are a brazen lot as well. <laughs> when I go to bed, they fly into the room with little tokens of affection. <laughs> no, little bits of string and worms and old toffee papers and that. That is graceful. How does your wife feel about all this? Oh, my, my loving helpmate has been very sympathetic. <laughs> up till this morning, that is. And what happened this morning? Well, she was sitting in her bath, in all innocence, when a seagull flew in and... and <laughs> I, 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 I hardly like to tell you this. I hardly like to listen. How? <laughs> it flew in and started building a nest in a soap dish <laughs> to be near me. You had me worried for a moment. Well, how do you think my wife fell? Sitting there with only a loofah to protect herself. So now she's suing me for divorce. Oh, dear, as bad as that. Worst. Am I to assume that the correspondent is a seagull? Well, no, no. I have asked our budget to provide the evidence. <laughs> We're going to Brighton for the weekend. <laughs> 
thought it better to keep the whole thing in the family. <laughs> and very wise. Less publicity. Uh, yes, yes. But now I have got another little problem. Oh, dear. Has your budgie refused to appear in court? No, but I've been up all night trying to teach it the oath. <laughs> Time now for our song spot, and for devotees of the art of antiphonic cantatas, we bring you the Maxi Lake Paris male voice choir. It's better now to open up your ear and sing. It's better now to hear the only voices ring <laughs> in a from a couple of contrapuntal homies. Yes. That's what we are. That's, That's what we it. are. We've just done a highly successful tour of your working men's club. And they loved us and we oh. loved them. Oh, oh what a yeah. triumph it was. Triumph. Oh, really always was. say if you want a big hand, you'll find it in a working man's club. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. Don't tell no lies. No, you will. And like us not, a lovely fella on the end of it. <laughs> like us not. Excuse me. Oh, hello. Thought you were going to put your head in a bucket and died. Not yet, but I probably will when you start singing. Oh, <laughs> Miss Prussic, straight out of the acid bottle. <laughs> right. uh, what song are you going to uh, delight us with today? Oh, yes. Uh, well, Chuck, I've had mm. several requests for a waltz by Joan Strauss. Johan! <laughs> Joan? You great nana. Johan Strauss, a fella. Oh, fella. fella. Johan. That's right, yo. Yeah. Johan. Han. Han. Yes. No. <laughs> and it's called Morning Papers. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I'll wait for the lunchtime edition. No, no. <laughs> In Vienna, there were grouses from a couple named of Schmidt. They lived next door to the Strausses, which they didn't like a bit. All night long, the waltzes cheerful came a pounding through the wall. And the Smiths, who got an earful, thought they couldn't sleep at all. Mrs. Schmidt would lay there shaking while her husband paced the floor, saying, Is there no escaping from the frightful dear next door? Then one night they found the answer, and it thrilled them both to bits. That's why Strauss wrote lots of waltzes. And why there's lots of little schmears. <laughs> now it's time for the Schmidt Report. <laughs> This week we take a look at the subject of education. Can we learn anything from it? I've just come back from nature study classes at the Adult Education Centre and tonight we were studying ladybirds. I think the ladybird must be the most frustrated person in the animal kingdom because do you know there's no such thing as a gentleman bird? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I went out with a school teacher once. Very nice it was, very nice indeed. Uh, I mean, who else but a teacher would keep making you do it over and over again until you got it right? <laughs> visual aids are becoming more and more a part of the educational chasm, and there is no stronger visual aid than television. Some educational programmes are very entertaining, but this seldom happens with subjects like mathematics. Why? Surely there can be emotion and drama, even in learning to count. <sighs> Stop it, Roger. You are a one. <laughs> Daphne, you're a one, two. I may be a one, two, but I want to be free. <laughs> free, Daphne? Free? What? Four. Can you blame me if five? If five find what my heart really seeks? You mean another man? But it's heaven. 
seven here in your arms. I hate you. I know I'm not denying it. Where are you going? Ten. What do you mean? Eight, nine, ten. Out. Three films have been released this week which take the teaching profession as their subject. The first of these deals with the revolt against corporal punishment in schools. It's called <laughs> The Cane Mutiny. <laughs> Four, five, six. There. Perhaps that'll teach you not to play about with the girls during lessons. Now get back to your class. Which one is it, by the way? 4B, sir. I'm teaching them history. <laughs> Love Life of a Sunday School Teacher is examined in the award-winning film Never on Weekdays. Oh, Arthur, I'm so ashamed. We shouldn't have done what we just done. I'm sorry, Mary, I'm not with my fault. Please don't cry. But how can I face those sweet, innocent children on Sunday, knowing that I've sinned twice? <laughs> What do you mean, twice? Well, we're going to do it again, aren't we? <laughs> Our final excerpt is from the updated upper-class version of Goodbye, Mr. Chips, entitled Au Revoir, Mr. French Fried Potatoes. <laughs> the scene opens in the housemaster's study. Come in. Ah, uh, Spencer, I believe you wanted to have a word. Well, I, uh, I, uh... Come along, I, come along, speak up, boy. I'm in love with your wife. Spencer, how dare you? I'm in love with your wife, sir. <laughs> Either way, I love her and we want to go away together. But if you run away with my wife, Spencer, I can't have it. <laughs> I won't have it. Uh, well... We thought perhaps Matron would be a consolation. Uh, Humphrey, there's something I must say to... Oh. It's all right, Enid. I've already told him everything. We're going away together tonight. But it's the big rugger match tomorrow and he's our leading scorer. Well, with all due respect, sir, I'd rather have a dead cert than a good try. Uh, <laughs> you are letting down the team, your house and the school. School, that's your trouble. You're a teacher 24 hours a day. I've never found out what you really think of me. Oh, you soon will. It's all in your end-of-term report. <laughs> that does it. Come along, Roger. Wait! Spencer, you can't go. You're a prefect. You give out the books and turn out the lights at bedtime. I'm sorry, sir. I must go. Oh, very well. Go. Go. Never darken my dorm again. <laughs> There's just one thing I want to say to you before I leave forever. And what's that? Can I have my catapult back? <laughs> <laughs> That was Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Miles Rudge and David Cumming and Derek Collier. The producer was John Simmons. killed one of your false eyelashes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock and Joan Sims in... Ah, 
ska vi snu med ja. Oh, today I'm delighted to be able to announce that my proud dispossession has finally been immortalised in wax. So, yes, yeah, so the generations to come will be able to thrill to the length and breadth of his reign. Here, yeah, what are you on about? My voice. Oh, I've made a record. It's a sort of sea shanty, a song I picked up from the men on board the shell fishing fleet of Great Yarmouth. Oh, <laughs> what's it called? These boats are made for welking. <laughs> We make a record together. I'd love to perform with you. <laughs> I can see it now on the record sleeve. Suddenly it's Joan Sims and Hugh Paddock. No, dear. Hugh Paddock and Joan Sims. Or even better, suddenly it's Hugh and Joan Paddock. Uh, uh, oh, it, oh, it gets right up your nose. I come on here in all good faith to try and gain a plug for my record and all you do is talk about yourselves. It's always the same. Self, self, self. Why can't you be like me? You know very well if I had any faults, which I haven't. Conceit would not be one of them. Douglas, Douglas, you've heard my record. Isn't it utterly, utterly, utterly marvellous? Out of this world. Yeah, you see. It's like nothing on earth. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but remember, when I'm number one of the charts, you won't be introducing Top of the Pops. The answer in both cases is not <laughs> likely. <laughs> I'm delighted to say it's Cracker Jack and Ori with Mother Time, which this week has a touch of the Arabian Nights. And floating down on her magic carpet, specially reinforced for the occasion, <laughs> here is exotic but wholesome Maud Nethersoul. Hello, Tinies, and Biggies too. I've just been up half the night with Omar Khayyam. <laughs> What an amazing old chap he is. <laughs> it's years since I looked at his rubaiyat. <laughs> and you know it's as fresh as ever. <laughs> and so here is a story of old Baghdad. There was once a sultan who had three wives. Fatima, Thinima, and in between Ima. <laughs> And they were always arguing about which one of them was the head wife. As you may know, the head wife of a sultan is a sultana, while the rest are just a lot of old dates. <laughs> so one night, when they were all half stoned, they decided to hold they decided to hold a competition in wifemanship. They sat the sultan down on a gem encrusted poof. <laughs> There were a lot of those in old Baghdad. <laughs> and then they placed the Sultan's Hubble Bubble in his hand, told him to behave himself, <laughs> and the competition commenced. Fatima did the dance of the seven Yashmaks, which had a big surprise finish. <laughs> yes, because she'd only put on six. <laughs> uh, Fatima gave a cookery demonstration called How to Do Something Different with an Oxtail, which astonished everyone, <laughs> especially the ox. <laughs> and uh, in between him are sang the riff song while balancing a glass of sherbet on one of her most outstanding features, <laughs> her aquiline nose. <laughs> After which the sultan said, Oh, beloved wives, I find myself in an impossible position. <laughs> His Hubble bubble was twisted round his chain of office, and uh, he didn't know whether to blow, suck or pull. <laughs> when he'd untangled himself, he said, To whom should the title go? To the lovely in between him are, to the voluptuous Fatima, or the regal Thinima? Well, in the end, he picked the regal Thinima. And off they all went, and for a simply super film. <laughs> but now, our song, it's called Kismet. <laughs> Some for 
fortune teller said, come inside my tent and I'll reveal my all to you. So naturally I went. He grabbed my arm and read my palms. His keys met, said he, then gave a sigh and tried to put his hand upon my knee. He said, you'll meet a stranger in the old bazaar. He'll have a silken tassel on his scimitar. Do what the stranger asks of you, his keys met, he quoth. And then his camel made a noise which quite surprised us both. <laughs> But one night when the moonlight was shining in the square, I met a bearded stranger who had tassels everywhere. We went behind the minaret, tis kismet, I said. But was it kismet? It was not. It was fortune-telling Fred. <laughs> So we come to our regular feature, Feeble Fables. Our story with the moral this week is set in a transport calf on the A1, where there's too much publicised rival gangs roar up and down on their high-powered motorbikes, the AA and the RAC. <laughs> but the calf is also patronised by skinheads, hell's angels and television producers looking for material for documentaries. Transport calf, what that posh fella was just talking about, and I give the boys their cups of tea and eggs and chips and anything else they ask for, <laughs> as long as they do it nicely. <laughs> but my favourites of all the customers were the Hell's Angels. Oh, what do you want to do tonight, Sid? I don't know, Engelbert. What do you want to do? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, last night it was good. We done up that village hall. Yeah. I think I said it looked much better with a coat of paint, right? <laughs> I'll tell you what, let's be like, uh, destructive, right? Go down the youth club and pinch all the table tennis balls, right? No, I feel like this ain't more adult. It's more mature. No, all right, then we'll go down the billiard hall and pinch all the chalk, right? No, no, it's not like that. It's like I feel sort of different. You know, there's something, <laughs> something stirring inside of me. <laughs> You ain't been drinking your coffee with a spoon in it again, have you? Hello, fellas. Hello, darling. That's a luscious looking pair of hamburgers you've got there. Yes, there's... <laughs> there's onions on one and tomato sauce. <laughs> <laughs> here, Vron. Vron, what are you doing after you knock off here? I thought we might, uh, you know, do something together. You men are all the same. All you think about is sex, I'm happy to say. <laughs> no, no. Like, we're Hell's Angels. We think about our motorbikes as well. Oh, I love motorbikes. Well, who's got the biggest one? I have. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, listen, it's a it's a thousand cc overhead valve twin carb BSS. Well, what's that stand for? Bleeding seldom stops. <laughs> no, no, straight up, Ron. If you want to, you come on a real bike. You come on mine. Yeah, he's got so many rear view mirrors you can't see out front. <laughs> <laughs> Sid Monday... <laughs> Sid Monday, Wednesday and Friday and Engelbert Tuesday, Thursdays and Saturday. Well, what about Sunday? Oh, not Sunday. That's a day of rest. <laughs> so, that's the way we done it. And on my very first Tuesday night, she come round my place at seven o'clock and we sat down on a sofa. We'd just gone up past ten when she said... Here, Engel. 
What about it? <laughs> what about what? Well, what about packing it up and watching the telly? <laughs> this, this idyllic arrangement went on and on and on for nearly three weeks until... Oh, Veronica. Engelbert. Oh, Engelbert. What's going on here, then? It's Friday. He's Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays. Well, he's Sundays as well now, cos I love him. Engelbert, take your hands off my girl or I'll punch you in the face twice. I don't care. She's worth it. Then come out of this. Oh! And again. Ooh! And the moral of this week's story is a bird in the hand is worth two in the mush. <laughs> Problem caller. Well, there may be a depression over Iceland, but that's nothing to what we have in the studio with our problem man of the week. My name is Clarence J. Mouse, partner, and I'm... I'm lost. Shall I call uh, the police? Uh, uh, I haven't finished. <laughs> lost for words to describe the pain I'm suffering on account of my very unusual hobby. And what might that be? Looking through the holes in LPs. <laughs> just... Just looking. Well, there's no room to do anything else, is there? <laughs> no, I suppose not. So, really, our problem is eye strain. No, no, not exactly, no. No. You see, yesterday I was in this record shop, glancing through the holes in the new releases, when I saw something. Untoward. <laughs> this, this strange lady. Strange? In what way? Oh, she was looking back at me through the hole. <laughs> through the hole in Schubert's Unfinished. How upsetting. What yeah. did she look like? Well, I, I couldn't see her face, of course, but she had a very nice eye. <laughs> And as uh, we had this mutual interest in records, she, she asked me round to see her collection. Said she had an old 78 of Nellie Melba. Well, I've always had a secret urge to look through a 78. <laughs> so you went? Yes, I did. Yes. Fool that I was. She drew the curtains and, and while she was taking her record out of its sleeve, I had a little blink, so I'd be all ready to enjoy myself, you see. And then I placed my eye to the hole, and she... She... Oh, I can't go on. Well, try. Better out than in. <laughs> That's wicked, that is. Uh, uh, Placed my eye to the hole, and she... Yes? She blew through it. <laughs> Time for our song spot. Come in, the Maxi Length Harris Male Voice Choir. It's bona to open up your can sing. It's bona to hear the Omi voices ring in a harmony. Yo, hello! hello. Oh, oh, greetings to all, especially to Mrs. Winifred Hoist of Crouch End. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, in love. Louder, ducky, in case her battery's on the blink. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Hello, in love. Tar ever so much for that bona fan letter and the lovely tea cosy what you crocheted it for us. <laughs> yes, lovely thought in every crochet, ducky, and made in the shape of a cottage. Yes, <laughs> yes it was. Just what we needed, especially him. <laughs> oh, it is, yes. If there's one thing I hate, it's having a cold pot. You don't like it. <laughs> oh, I go right off, don't I? He does, right he off. does. I really do. Flounce out the house with never a word. No. And there's me all on my own till all hours. Yeah. Mm, wondering whether to ring the police and ask them round. 
Oh, yes, he's got their number, haven't you, Chuck? Oh, you're not kidding. You say that again. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, hello. I thought you'd sit through a crack in the floorboards. <laughs> BBC floorboards don't have cracks. And if I might slip in a word in there... <laughs> oh, it's Miss Tart. Straight out of the cake shop window, though. <laughs> I'd like to know what you're going to sing. The Soldier's Chorus from Faust. <laughs> oh, no. Sergeant, sing us a marching song And we'll all sing as we march along My boots are feeling a bit too small And so is me blouse and so is me vest And that isn't all <laughs> Tramp, 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 tramp Oh, Sergeant, sing us a gay refrain As we go marching across the plain My rifle's heavy as it can be I think I should drop unless I can stop for a fag And it's... Here, here, you're supposed min, to be... Min, you're supposed to be min. tramping, not mincing I know, <laughs> Dolly they had to take me boots off. They were killing me. <laughs> can't mark, so they've a hole in your sock. Ooh. Think of the honour of the regiment, Ducky. <laughs> well, I can't mend it here, can I? I mean, I haven't got my little work basket. You could have fooled me. <laughs> oh, oh, no, here. Eh? I get fell in for the last verse. Mm. Oh, Sergeant, promise you'll bear in mind to oh, Miss Trollin' along behind. Root marching isn't the life for us. The way that we feel, we're hoping that we'll come home on the back. Get fell out, you lot, and pitch camp! You must be joking. <laughs> It's time for the Smith Report. This week's main topic, love, which poses the question, if all the world loves a lover, why do they close the parks after dark? <laughs> what does the man in the street have to say? I come from Sweden, where we believe in the principle of free loving, or four, or five, <laughs> or six. Love? Well, me and my old man have been married for over 40 years. And do you know, when we're alone together, we still hold hands? I think it's wonderful you still like to do that. Like to? We have to, otherwise we'd kill each other. <laughs> so much for public opinion, but what are the views of an expert? Yes, assistant to the assistant to the minister. It is my responsibility to look after the moral welfare of young people today. Because, quite frankly, there's too much of it going on. <laughs> They're obsessed with love and uh, sex and all that stuff. <laughs> ah, well, well, it's got to stop. You young men are the worst, so we've come up with an alternative. The yo-yo. <laughs> So the next time you see a mini-skirted girl fleshing her thighs in the, uh, in the summer sunshine, oh, well, don't get excited. See, get out your yo-yo. Yes. Just have a good yo. And it won't cost you anything. No, under our new scheme, government-issued yo-yos will be, will be supplied free to all young men under 30. Yo-yoing never did anybody any harm. <laughs> uh, apart from the possibility of occasional cramp in the string finger. Uh, when you get yours, use it. And don't abuse it. Now remember our slogan, when you feel like getting going, get yoing! Are there are tests to see if people are fit to drive a car. Why not examinations to find out if people are fit to be married and live together? If there were, the L test would take on a completely new meaning. <laughs> Not too fast, Miss Wilkins. <laughs> <laughs> it 
take it easy. <laughs> this is a tricky bit. Mm. Mm, that was good. <laughs> left, <laughs> left hand up. Okay? <laughs> No, 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 watch where you're going. <laughs> Clutch control, Miss Wilkins. Oh, good. 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 Geraldine! Mm. Mm. <clears throat> and that, Miss Wilkins, is what we call an emergency stop. Another aspect of love is the love story. He took off his overcoat and hung it in the wardrobe. She removed her hat, her cardigan and shoes. He took off his jacket and flannels and shirt and folded them neatly. She took off her underwear and slipped into a pink baby doll nighty. He removed the rest of his clothes and put on his blue silk pyjamas. She climbed into the right side of the bed. He climbed into the left-hand side of the bed. She smiled to herself as she lay there in room 409 in the Dorchester Hotel, London. But as he was in the station hotel, Bradford, they both turned over and went to sleep. <laughs> Most traditional love stories, however, end with the words, and they lived happily ever after. But is this merely wishful thinking? The Smith Report examines the continuing story of Cinderella. Setting is the palace, six months after the wedding. Cinderella and the prince are yelling things over. Me? What about you? What about me? What about me? Listen here, Mrs. Charming. Nay hard up. <laughs> I've heard all about what happened between you and that buttons in the kitchen before the ball. Nothing happened. He was just showing me something that made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> showing you what? His party piece. His conjuring tricks. He's very clever with his hands. So I've heard. Oh, go away and leave me alone. All right, Cinderella, but I'll be back. I'm still suspicious about what happened between you and Dandini in the wood. He came back that night with a letter in his tights. Phew. Quick, open the wardrobe. It's all right, Buttons. He's gone. Yeah. Do you think he suspects? Well, of course he does. Didn't he come in and catch us in the act? No, but a couple of minutes later and he would have done. <laughs> oh, Buttons, hold me. Thrill me. Kiss me. One at a time or all together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cinders. You're a bit of hot stuff. It's <laughs> very witty. <laughs> you in the act. Yes, I'm afraid this time you have. Guards! I'll have you hung, drawn and quartered. Then eighth. <laughs> and you, Cinderella, will languish in the East Tower. Languish! Languish! Yeah, watch you languish. <laughs> it is witty, it really is. <laughs> Take them away! Here, no, here, not so rough. You're hurting my arm. Oh, take your hands off my buttons. Oh! <laughs> oh, I am undone! Away with them! <laughs> and shut the door after you. <laughs> now then, where's my address book? Let's see. Mm -hmm. Annabelle, Maureen, Veronica, Jane. Oh. <sighs> I don't know about Cinderella, but I'm certainly going to live happily ever after. That was Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Miles Rudge and David Cumming and Derek Collier. The producer was John Simmons. <laughs>